<coughs> Thank you for the uh, introduction, Debbie, and reminding me how long I've been here, uh, which is uh, a bit of a shock to the system, really. But um, yeah, for those many of you here who don't know me, um, I deal largely with structural fire engineering issues here at BRE, uh, and that's a very varied area, which includes research, includes consultancy, includes site investigation, fire investigation, standards development, um, and it also crucially involves looking at performance where there's no readily available standard means of test and assessment. So sometimes the research itself is actually looking to develop ways to assess performance. Um, and I think rather with the link to Roger's presentation this morning, what I'm going to talk to you about today is something which started out for me as a research area and ended up with a practical application. So in the fire research conference, it's good to see there is a practical application for fire research. So in terms of uh, the scope of the presentation, uh, I'll put my glasses on so I can read this bit. Uh, a bit of background to what you're going to hear today. Um, mention of explosive spalling of concrete and what that means and what it actually entails. Uh, discussion on test and assessment, historic research at BRE that backs up uh, the work we do and the work we have done on tunnel linings, a look at previous commercial testing, can't say too much about that, but some of the projects we've been involved with in the past. Um, I'm then, then going to talk specifically about the Crossrail project for which we did uh, quite a lot of work for many of the joint ventures who were working on Crossrail. Um, which should I think have opened by now, but it's now running about a year late, so there we go. And the next steps looking forward are for HS2, which is the next large civil engineering project covering this area. So, uh, unfortunately, research, a lot of research, tends to be reactive rather than proactive. And this area is no different, and a lot of the research was stimulated from some very large fire incidents a uh, number of which are up there, uh, probably quite old, some of these. Um, but the main issue was that these uh, incidents caused a great deal of structural damage, caused a great consequential loss in terms of uh, finance, and also in many cases throughout the world have led to loss of life. So therefore there's a, there was, uh, a number of years ago, a major justification for looking at uh, this issue. <laughs> So the work discussed today is principally uh, looking at measures to mitigate the effects of explosive spalling of concrete structures. Explosive spalling is a phenomenon that can be catastrophic, so what is it and what does it entail? Um, it generally occurs as a function of a number of interrelated parameters. Chief among those are a rapid rate of temperature rise, particularly in the early stages of a fire. The presence of restraint against thermal expansion, which can be adjacent structures or it can actually be the, the presence of load. The permeability, uh, porosity, density and strength of the concrete, and there's a particular relationship between high strength concrete and explosive spalling, which I'll go into in a minute. And when we're dealing with tunnel fires specifically, tunnel fires often involve the use of high strength concrete. The nature of the construction of where it is and how it's, uh, it's constructed involves significant restraint to thermal expansion. And the nature of the fire load itself for tunnels, often involving petrochemical tankers, leads to a rapid rise in temperature in the event of a fire. So what we often have with tunnel structures is a perfect storm of all these parameters which tend to promote explosive spalling of concrete structures. So... <coughs> Given the nature of uh, tunnel fires and the form of construction used in tunnels, it is essential to ensure that the proposed design solution is capable of resisting a hydrocarbon fire whilst under load. It's very important that the rapid rates of temperature are effectively uh, um, <coughs> modelled and that the uh, system itself is restrained against thermal expansion. Unfortunately, there is no standardised approach for the testing and approval of tunnel lining segments in relation to fire performance. There are a number of different methods used, ad hoc methods used in different countries. There has been some uh, attempt 
to produce a standard uh, which is through this uh, FNARC uh, document here, specification and guidelines for testing of passive fire protection for concrete tunnel linings. Um, unfortunately, this particular standard doesn't actually uh, require the use of an imposed load, which I think is a major shortfall. One of the things you'll notice with tunnel fires is that there are a number of different fire curves which are used. Some of the more common ones are illustrated here. Um, which range from the RWS curve, which is the uh, highest one, reaching temperatures above 1,300 degrees and often leading to melting of concrete structures, to uh, other hydrocarbon curves, whether the Eurocode curve, other uh, curves used by the rail industry. So, at BRE, this is uh, a bit of history, which will take us back to Patrick's earlier uh, discussion previously, as nothing comes from nothing. Um, my first involvement in this was looking at high strength concrete columns in construction rather than tunnels initially, um, with a focus on the tendency of the elements to spawn in an explosive manner. Now this uh, work took place many years ago and was, to my knowledge, was the original work looking at the use of polypropylene fibres to mitigate the effects of explosive spalling. Uh, we used a number of different columns subject to a combination of uh, different levels of applied load uh, using a compression machine which is still here in the structures lab um, and a fire exposure provided by a portable gas fired furnace which looks something like this. So you can see here we have a 500 ton compression machine and a small gas fired portable furnace which enables you to develop very high temperatures within quite a confined space. The project was reasonably successful. Um, this is a comparison between two of the ones there. Uh, what you've got there is 100, which is 100 Newton concrete, which is high strength. Uh, on the left-hand side with silica, the same mix, but with uh, polypropylene fibres on the right-hand side. And this shows a relative performance between the extent of spalling. Um, it should be better, but this was the only one on the, one on the left that actually survived the test. The rest of the columns we uh, swept up using a dustpan and brush and just put into the bin. So uh, uh, although the, the, the relative performance isn't so great there, it's much greater than the ones we uh, shoveled into the bin. So as a consequence of this work, we produced some design guidance which was used by the industry and promoted the use of polypropylene fibres for applications other than building structures and particularly for tunnels and also had an input to the work we were doing uh, on the concrete building at Cardington. So again, although not strictly related to tunnel linings, uh, what you can see here is the interior of the compartment we uh, set fire to at Cardington. And we had a particular concern about the intermediate columns, which were high strength concrete, but did include polypropylene fibres. So during the test, we produced, a, a manufactured a support frame because we were concerned the columns might collapse and bring down the whole building. As it happened, the columns performed adequately, uh, but we didn't take enough account of the fact that you get other types of spalling, and you can maybe see in the picture on the right-hand side, we had aggregate spalling of the concrete slab, and you can see the uh, reinforcement exposed. So explosive spalling isn't the only mechanism that we've got to consider. So following this, we've uh, been involved in quite a lot of commercial work uh, where we've provided specialist fire test service for a number of high-profile projects, including uh, CTRL, Channel Tunnel Rail Link, uh, Heathrow T5 uh, Tunnel, and the Hindhead Road Tunnel. Um, in all of these cases, we were developing the methodology in consultation with the client because we were looking at specific considerations for specific projects, so not following a standardised procedure. Um, but I think from the work we've done, we are now in a better position to develop such a procedure. Um, and the input from these projects also provided a major, uh, <coughs> a major input into the specification for the testing of sprayed concrete linings for Crossrail, which I'll discuss briefly now. Um, just this is maybe a better indication of the uh, potential impact of polypropylene fibres in preventing spalling. Uh, these two samples were both identically cured, identically cast, 
identically loaded and identically uh, exposed to the same fire exposure and you can obviously see the difference here in terms of the spool and the concrete. So uh, Crossrail, major, major project, uh, lots of different uh, contractors involved. There were two different specifications written for the testing for uh, concrete. One was for SCL, which is sprayed concrete linings, and the other was for the precast elements. Now, I wasn't quite sure for the same project why you required two different specifications, but uh, again, I'll say a little bit more about that at the end. Um, both the sprayed concrete linings and the precast segmental units require the use of the Eureka time curve, which we'll see in a, a second, uh, which goes up to 1,200 degrees in five minutes, so very rapid early uh, rise in temperature. And the requirement for the sprayed concrete linings required an axial compression of five megapascals, five newtons per uh, millimetre squared. And there were both large and small-scale test samples involved. And the performance criteria was based on the depth of spalling, the temperature rise within the slab, and particularly the impact on the waterproof layer through the depth of the structural concrete, and the residual strength of the heated con con concrete. Uh, this shows the Eureka test time temperature curve, which was used for the Crossrail project, and is also the same uh, exposure which is in the current specification for HS2 testing. I mentioned there were two different types of specimen. On the left-hand side is a cylindrical specimen which is tested not under load, and this is maybe if you've got some questions about your mix and you don't have a great confidence in performance, you can do effectively a small-scale test to look at the mix before you go on to the larger tests uh, using a larger panel section and uh, instrumented. The, uh, <coughs> the thermocouple specification included um, in the test procedure um, required thermocouples to be installed at specific locations to look at the depth of spalling and the impact in terms of heat transfer through the structure. And this required the specimens to be instrumented on site. So we went to the various locations of uh, the contractors at various locations in London and we installed the thermocouples on site, which uh, it's quite an important um, part of the test procedure and the uh, performance criteria and has to be done correctly. It's also very important, particularly with concrete structures, that you're dealing with panels which are consistent, consistent in their manufacturer, consistent in, their, in the casting and particularly in the curing. And one of the areas we uh, have here, we have also at VRE specialists in environmental control who can provide us with chambers to achieve the specification in terms of curing. And the test panels look something like this. This is from either side. So on the left-hand side, you can see the unexposed face of the test specimen under load and, and under fire exposure. And on the right-hand side, you can see the back of the furnace we now use, slightly different from the one you saw before. I mentioned the performance criteria. Um, one of them is the residual strength for the concrete after fire exposure, and this requires us to core uh, through the unexposed face to the exposed face through the full depth, and then this core is cut into sections, and the sections tested for compression testing. And again, this is something we can do a bit of joined up work with uh, a building technology group here who look after this area of the work. We deal with the fire testing, so it's a coordinated uh, approach across BRE using different expertise, um, which is very important. The Crossrail specification, I mentioned this is for sprayed concrete linings and there was a different specification for the precast linings. Same fire curve, different specimen size and shape, different loading arrangement. And what's critical here for the contractors involved is it wasn't possible to do this testing in this country because there wasn't the facilities. Um, Basically, they had to ship the uh, segments out to Holland to do the testing, which was a major uh, financial constraint. And I think you have to wonder if it's actually necessary, given that you have the concrete is the concrete, whether it's sprayed concrete or precast, I don't think it matters too much. There are other means of assessing performance once built, and uh, there are uh, organisations within Europe who do portable furnace testing of tunnels if there are problems uh, in situ. So moving on, 
We've had some background. We've talked about Crossrail. The next thing that uh, we're going to be faced with is looking to provide some sort of performance assessment for HS2. Um, the specification prepared for the fire testing of tunnel linings for HS2 is available and it covers both the sprayed concrete linings and the precast unit, so all the concrete, uh, and there's no distinction in this case. And the concluding remarks, what I've tried to do is talk you through a, a brief history, very brief history, of how research can have a, a, a practical application. I think we're now looking at a situation where we require a standardised procedure to be developed, but that does allow flexibility for specific projects, because the fire loading won't be the same for every tunnel, for instance, um, so it may need some, some flexibility. Uh, the Crossrail specification and the current HS2 specification could provide a useful starting point in specifying the fire test and assessment methodology which is robust and does not impose an unreasonable financial burden on contractors. Thank you very much for your attention. question or two for Tom. Are there any? Sorry, I'll put the lights on the night you see. <laughs> Are there any questions for Tom at the moment? No? Ben. Oh, yeah, Ben. Hi. Thanks. Uh, ben from University of Edinburgh. At Edinburgh, we've got eight strips, I guess, which you know about. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the aims of eight strips, which is a a variable radiant heat uh, panel was to complement or replace these big scale standardized tests. Uh, where do you think that um, is going in terms of the future and what are the barriers to adoption and do you think it, it forms part of the overall solution or do you think it could replace large scale standardized testing in total? Okay, uh, it's a good A lot question. of questions there, sorry, but I mean just a general idea. Yeah, I mean I'm not so familiar with the specific characteristics uh, of your facility. In terms of this sort of work, what's important is that you can achieve the rates of temperature rise in the early phases. Because um, I mentioned the precast specification for Crossrail, where you do testing out in Holland in general, uh, to the RWS curve, they have a peak temperature which is 1360, which is, to my mind, it's irrelevant, because the spalling will occur in the first, say, 10 minutes of fire exposure. And if you can achieve the rate of temperature rise in the early phases, then there's no reason why you couldn't use that facility. But it's important that you can do that in order to provide a realistic assessment. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, then, Tom.